and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. You know, corn nematodes have gotten a lot of press lately, but it's still corn rootworms that are robbing a lot of yield across the country. We're going to talk about managing corn rootworm with traits and without on today's show. Well, something that hasn't gotten a lot of press is a nutrient we want to talk about today. That's cobalt. Should you actually be fertilizing with cobalt on your farm? We'll talk about that today. Now, one thing you definitely should be stopping on your farm is our Weed of the Week. We'll give you some tips on stopping it on your farm. But first, here's our Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about the advantages and disadvantages of no-till or a no-till system. We get so many questions about this from non-farmers asking about no-till and, hey, shouldn't all farmers go no-till? We want to talk about the pluses and minuses to no-till. Some of the positive aspects of no-till are really obvious. If you've got steep slopes on your farm, well, doing tillage exposes that soil to especially water erosion but you think about all the fall tillage that happened again in 2017 and those acres are exposed to wind erosion too. So keeping soil in place is one of the best things about no-till. It does a nice job at holding soil where it's supposed to be and even allowing farmers to build up topsoil over the years. What the farmer does in a no-till system is he leaves all the plants out there from the previous year. Yes, most crops are annual crops, so all that plant material is dead. But still, there are roots in the ground. There is a little bit of stalk in the ground. There are stalks above ground. There are leaves from after harvest that are laying above ground. So all those things help hold the soil in place, number one. And also, when rain falls, it doesn't hit the soil with as much impact. That impact is slowed because there is old plant material on top of the soil surface. When farmers don't have to do tillage, they clearly save time and fuel on their farm. Think about the jobs that farmers are doing that burn the most fuel. Well, it's tillage because they're digging something with iron down deep in the soil and it's hard to pull those machines. So farmers cut back big time on diesel fuel expense. They also save all that time that they'd be out tilling. Now you may say, well, how do they control weeds then in a no-till system? Well, one of the things that they'll do is use herbicides, and it doesn't take much fuel or much time to run a sprayer across a field. The other big advantage to no-till, especially in our part of the country where we're very dry, is the moisture savings with no-till. Every time you till a field, they talk about one inch of moisture loss, and hey, let's face it, if that ground is pretty black, there's a lot of heat that goes out, there's moisture that goes out, that's really not a good thing when you're not getting rain for a month or even two months at a time. Well, speaking of that rain, by leaving the root system intact, it really helps microbial life build up in the soil because you're not disturbing their homes. And then when you've got decayed or decaying roots, they leave channels for water and for bugs uh, down in the soil. It's a real positive in terms of water holding and nutrient holding capabilities. All right, so it all sounds great with no-till, but here are a couple of reasons why we switched away from no-till quite a few years ago. We had gone to no-till for the erosion savings, the moisture savings, that was great, and it worked. But the problems we ran into, number one, nutrient stratification. Almost all the non-mobile nutrients in our soil, like phosphorus and zinc, for example, ended up in about the top two inches of soil. When we have dry conditions, we have plenty of moisture down deep in the ground a lot of times in our heavier soil, and we had roots down deep in the ground. What we didn't have was fertility. So what we really want is deeper fertility. What we ended up doing in the no-till acres, we switched to strip-till so we could place fertilizer down eight or 10 inches deep. That eliminated our nutrient stratification issue. The other reason why we switched away from no-till is poor spring emergence. Every spring, we're very cold. We like to plant when the frost is either still in the ground or it has just come out of the ground. Those soils are cold. It's gonna take time for a no-till soil to heat up as opposed to a tilled soil. Quite often we find the temperature difference seven to 10 degrees. So rather than doing a full conventional till system, we like strip till where we have left it no-till in between the rows and the only place we till is right in the row. 
so that row gets a lot warmer. And again, we can place that fertilizer deeper. Those are the two big reasons why we switched away from no-till and in my eyes, the two big disadvantages to no-till. All right, some other things that could be viewed as a negative, I look at them as well, there's some different management things that are needed, is you're going to have more insect problems when you've got no-till, especially insects that are in the soil. Because again, you haven't disturbed their home and you've left lots of cover, winter survival's better and so forth, lots of factors there. So you're gonna have to do something about the bugs. The other thing is you're gonna have more disease problems because a lot of times disease will overwinter on the plant residue that's left in the field. And then when you look at the weeds, the weed spectrum changes changes too, you end up with more winter annual weeds and even more perennial weeds when you're not doing tillage. Well, once again, no-till has a lot of great advantages. There are people who love it around the country and around the world, and we absolutely think reducing tillage is a great thing to do on many farms. On the other hand, there are certainly some disadvantages. There, there's no perfect tillage system, no perfect way to farm, but farmers just have to adapt based on their conditions and their environment. Well, our Weed of the Week can thrive in a no-till system or a conventional till situation. Can you identify this week's weed? About two or three years ago, I went ahead and I started planting nothing but Liberty. And I haven't regretted it since. We've had no problems with uh, resistance. All the resistance mare's tail that we had out there, velvet leaf or cockleburrs or pigweed. I clean up the fields. I didn't have to go back. One application took care of the weeds. If I wasn't getting control on weeds and would have to fight it all year long, I wouldn't hesitate to guess that we'd probably be losing uh, at least 25% of yield. First time I ever used Liberty Link beans, I had it right next to Roundup beans. The uh, Liberty Link beans were uh, standing about twice as tall. They had uh, twice as many pods on it. That was the thing that sold me on it. If it can do it there on that tough ground, let's just start spreading it over the whole place. And that's what I did. And I went 100% and I haven't looked back. We love the quality, we love the construction. We're looking forward to working with Morton in the future. They have this down to a science. They know exactly what you want. They know how to make it happen. It's an easy process. I would definitely recommend Morton. From the first time I met the salesman to the last nail that the crew put in, it has been a positive and professional experience. I'm so happy I found Morton because they just make the job so easy. Find the building of your dreams at mortonbuildings.com. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Grow your incentives, not weeds. Earn an additional $6 per acre in cash back when you apply Extendamax herbicide with Vapor Grip technology on your Roundup Ready to Extend soybeans, along with endorsed herbicides from Roundup Ready Plus Crop Management Solutions. Now you have the right tools to manage weeds and your bottom line. Visit GrowYourIncentives.com to see your total incentives opportunity. The Guardian Air Twin Spray Nozzle from Hypro produces a twin spray pattern with air inducted droplets for superior coverage, even in dense canopies. Be effective and efficient with your spray application this season with the Guardian Air Twin. Hypro, helping you spray better. All right, when we start talking about nutrients, you probably think about N, P, and K. You may think about sulfur, a secondary nutrient, and you might even think about micronutrients but I'm gonna guess you're probably never thinking about cobalt. That's what we wanna talk about today. All right, you're not gonna get the next 20 bushels of corn yield by adding cobalt. Let's just get that out of the way right off the bat then. Well, as far oh, as we I know found here. a secret weapon here. <laughs> you know, no, I don't think cobalt is that weapon. I don't think it has a big nutritive effect on the corn, at least that we know of at this point. But we do see a difference in livestock health. Like in a pasture situation, for example, if we've got decent cobalt levels in a pasture, all of a sudden we have less animal health issues with our livestock herds. So there's something there, we just don't know exactly what it all is. Okay, so when you look at the Ag PhD Fertilizer Removal App, you're not gonna find cobalt. This is something that we really just started talking about here in the last couple years in a very small way. And you might say, well, if it's not a big deal, why are you guys even bringing this up? Here's why. 
because we have a lot of farmers that we work with that are really pushing the limits of corn and soybean yields today, and wheat too for that matter, and they keep asking us, what else is there? What else could I be looking at? What else could I be trying? So yes, we want you to focus on those primary, secondary, and micronutrients, the common five micronutrients we talk about. But once you've done a lot of that stuff, once you've eliminated your drainage issues and a lot of the other problems you've had on your farm, hey, this might be something for you to look at. And part of the reason why we bring this up too is we've done some tests on our own farm and we have not found decent cobalt levels at all. We found, in fact, no cobalt on most of our ground. Here again, to do that testing, you've got to specifically request some of these nutrients like cobalt and nickel and molybdenum. They're not going to show up even on what your lab will call a complete test. Your complete test is probably just going to be the essential nutrients for your crop. So do some testing like Brian was talking about. Take a look around your farm, maybe just in a few spots, and look for some of these you know, trace elements, we'll call them, like cobalt and nickel and moly. See what you're finding with them, and if they're not even at detectable levels, that could tell you, you know, this might be something I might try. You might use a blended micronutrient product that has some of those things in it, for example, so you know you're gonna get some benefit out of the zinc that it contains or whatever else, but you're also getting a little bit of cobalt, and then see what kind of differences you see on your farm. Well, once again, cobalt probably isn't a big thing for you to think about or even worry about on your farm, but we're bringing it up just to hopefully kind of stretch your mind a little bit and get you thinking that, you know what, rather than just the same old stuff everybody's always talked about, maybe we need to start looking at some different things. Cobalt absolutely can be an issue in terms of livestock health. Could it be a little bit of a factor in corn, soybean and wheat yields, vegetable crop yields, that type of thing? I don't know. I believe it could be on a very small scale. I also know you don't need a whole lot of cobalt. It's an incredibly uh, low level that you're going to need in a plant for even sufficient levels. So if you've already done a lot of other great things, you're already getting really high yields, maybe take a look at this. Or maybe if you've got livestock, take a look at this and just see, run some trials on your farm, see if it actually can make a difference. Cobalt is something we want you to look at at some point in the future. One other thing you want to keep an eye out for in your fields is our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We count it. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on, Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. There are micronutrients throughout the league, Joe, but let's take a look at Micro 500. Yeah, the synergy of the micronutrients in this guy have raised the bar on the field. Those others are just wanna be Micro 500s. So you think this is the player you'd want on your team? You bet, whether it's offense, defense, special teams, Micro 500 always has a place on the field. <laughs> okay, you can check out Micro 500 stats at agroliquid.com. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. M, P, and K. They're critical for a healthy crop. Improve their availability and your yield potential with Quick Roots Microbial Seed Inoculant. Quick Roots technology contains two powerful microbes that can help improve access to key nutrients, and it's available in an easy to apply formulation. Simply mix it directly into your dry planter box and your seeds will be covered. 
Learn more at MonsantoBioAg.com slash QuickRoots. Corn rootworm is a major problem in U.S. corn production, but how to manage it? Well, there's a number of different ways that you could be effective managing corn rootworm. Well, there are really only two if you want to plant corn. So yes, we can talk about crop rotation, but let's say you really want to plant corn and you're just dead set on, hey, I'm planting continuous corn. You got two choices, either insecticide or BT. Well, and it may not even be two choices, Brian. It may be one. Use all these options that we have available if you've got heavy pressure. And we've seen this time and time again, and it really starts with an understanding of how that BT works. For that BT trait to work that's in corn, the rootworm has to take a bite out of that corn root. And in trials that we've seen where there's heavy, heavy pressure, that isn't enough. You're still going to have issues with stock lodging. You're still going to have issues with yield loss if you've got super heavy pressure. So you may need insecticide as well. I want to go back and talk just for a minute about what is that BT. We get so many questions from non-farmers about just overall food safety and what's happening. Just understand that the BT is a protein. Okay, you think about, oh, I've got to eat meat so I get protein into my body, right? Well, this is just another protein. The difference with this BT protein is, well, humans and livestock can digest it just fine. Certain insects, like corn rootworm, cannot digest it. Well, very specific insects, and that's the thing too. It doesn't kill all bugs. It just kills very specific ones. And it was interesting, I was learning about how the corn borer BTs work, and they actually dissolve just fine in an acid-based digestive system like we have. But in an alkaline-based digestive system like certain bugs have, well, they turn to crystals and they can't dissolve them. And that's what's going on here. So you say, well, how is that protein safe for us? Guess what? We have an acid-based digestive system. So we're going to be just fine. We have no issue digesting that and actually utilizing its nutritive value. The big problem, though, with the BT trait is we're starting to see resistance. In fact, pretty widespread resistance to single BT traits. What we talk about with farmers who are really concerned about this is, hey, just have multiple BT traits. For example, smart stacks. Okay, you're gonna have two different rootworm traits. That's really going to help. At this point, we haven't seen any major issues with two traits all in the same thing, but nevertheless, if it was me after I've just had resistance with one, and, and believe me, we've had resistance right around here and right in our farm area. So because I'm worried about that, even with smart sex, I'm still at least gonna use some insecticide. The question is how much? Because a lot of people say, well, boy, I don't wanna spend 20 or $30 an acre on insecticide. You don't have to, especially when you've got smart stacks out there already. I'd probably only spend maybe three, $5, maybe eight at the most. All right, and speaking about the insecticides, uh, they've kind of taken the same approach in, in that sector of our industry of having more than one mode of action. You see products like Aztec that have been out for a long time, but now there's Smart Choice and, and many others that are putting to use two different modes of action here to try to prevent any kind of resistance by the bugs. The other thing is we're looking for good killing power. So we're seeing farmers across the country increasing their rates on insecticides to try to get more activity out of them as they're going in the furrow or in a two by two or in a T-band or however they're applying that insecticide. The key here is going to be to get them in close proximity to the roots because that's what we need to protect. Now a T-band is nice in that you're going to spread some out on top of the ground and that's gonna work its way down through the soil to protect shallow roots. When you put it all in furrow, that product is really only gonna spread down and out. So it's not really going to protect roots above it. And we see a lot of those nodal roots being above it. So I do like the T-band, that's my preferred approach. Some insecticides will only be labeled for in furrow based on safety. So there's going to be a number of choices that you have to make if you wanna use an insecticide on your farm. All right, the last big thing is liquid versus dry. What should you use on your farm? The dries are better. Okay, they're usually five to 10% better in our experience, but the liquid's a lot less expensive. You can go with Capture LFR, for example, and even get the biological VGR for probably eight bucks an acre for the full rate. It's very inexpensive. So that's a real good option for you. And like I said, if I'm doing smart stacks already, I'm probably using a half rate. So it's not gonna cost very much money. The other nice thing about Capture LFR or VGR, you can put it right in with your liquid fertilizer. So you don't have to have a different delivery system or anything like that. 
yeah, it would be nice not to have another system, but on the other hand, you could have something like smart boxes and then you never have to handle that pesticide. You just set the box on, you're done, no contact. Okay, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, all pesticides or insecticides are super safe, but when I look at the old stuff, we used to use counter and diphenate and thymet. They were way more dangerous than any of the things we're using today on the farm. Force, Aztec, Capture, these are relatively safe insecticides to human beings. So I'm a lot more excited about using an insecticide than I was 20 years ago. And why are we talking about corn rootworms? You're going to see it in the yield data that you see from plots across the country this year. Wow, there is an impact with corn rootworms on the non-rootworm traded hybrids because a lot of these plots, they don't put insecticide on. So you can start to see what the differences are and smart stacks hybrids and, and hybrids where they did put insecticide on really stood out in performance. Having good corn rootworm control is important to yield, but so is weed control. We'll talk about our weed of the week coming up next. The weed of the week is brought to you by Dow AgroSciences. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough, but we're tougher with unrivaled weed control, reduced drift, and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the week is Velvet Leaf. Ah, this is one of the best names for a weed out there because it's so accurate. Yep. When you touch those leaves, they really are velvety and they kind of smell a little bit. Uh, some would say they smell a little like dog urine. I haven't really tried to smell dog urine lately, but I know it is kind of a foul odor when you pull velvet leaf and you smell your hand afterwards. You're also going to see with velvet leaf, once it gets a little bit bigger, the plant in size, very big leaves. That's why sometimes velvet leaf is called elephant ear. All right, with velvet leaf, it has a very small seed. It germinates most commonly in the top half inch to inch of soil. It's actually a weed that we can do a good job controlling with pre-emerge herbicides. Now, some of these weeds that get big like this, we think, well, cocklebur or sunflower, you can't get them with pre's. That's true. Velvet leaf, you can. Well, I really like python as a pre-emerge herbicide. And you might say, python? We haven't used that in 15 years. Well, you may actually have used it lately because it's found in SureStart and TripleFlex pre-emerge herbicides for corn. If you're using a crop where you can use Command, that's another product that's had good activity on velvet leaf early. So we do encourage you, get a good pre-program down there. We talk about the three pre's all the time in soybeans. I would probably add some python to that in soybeans. Okay, the other thing too, Brian, is you could add pursuit. And if that fits yes. in your rotation, pursuit has come way down in price. And there's way so down. many different ways you can get it in combination products as well. Yep, so post-emerge, you can use pursuit. You can go out there with a number of different herbicides, whether it's first rate, roundup, liberty, extend, uh, or certainly enlist if that does get labeled this year. In wheat, we normally don't fight a lot of velvet leaf, but it's pretty easy to control. You can start off with sharpen down, come back over the top with husky. And in corn, I like the HPPD's post, so I don't like to use them pre. I do like Sure Start and Triple Flex though. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week Velvet Leaf, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We counted. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on, Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. Nodulation, it's essential for nitrogen fixation in soybeans, but how can you help it happen in your fields? Monsanto BioAg offers inoculants that answer that question. Microbial seed applied solutions that work to establish high populations of rhizobia in your fields, helping with optimum nodulation and increased performance in your soybeans. 
Learn how inoculants powered by nature can help you at MonsantoBioAg.com slash inoculate. Let's face it, Joe. Some of these guys aren't easy to play. Biologicals are expensive. Humates and plant growth regulators are messy. Yeah, but AgroLiquid has four new players that have really eliminated those problems. The Primer Go line has helped their team realize the benefits. Wait, so season-long nutrition and optimized yields while creating a biologically active soil? That's right. Primer Go line is a fantastic addition to AgroLiquid's stellar team. We love the quality, we love the construction. We're looking forward to working with Morton in the future. They have this down to a science. They know exactly what you want. They know how to make it happen. It's an easy process. I would definitely recommend Morton. From the first time I met the salesman to the last nail that the crew put in, it has been a positive and professional experience. I'm so happy I found Morton because they just make the job so easy. Find the building of your dreams at mortonbuildings.com. Grow your incentives, not weeds. Earn an additional $6 per acre in cash back when you apply Extendamax herbicide with Vapor Grip technology on your Roundup Ready to Extend soybeans, along with endorsed herbicides from Roundup Ready Plus Crop Management Solutions. Now you have the right tools to manage weeds and your bottom line. Visit GrowYourIncentives.com to see your total incentives opportunity. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. The AFS Connect Farm Management System from Case IH connects you and only you to the information you need most from your equipment from anywhere at any time. AFS Connect, only from Case IH. What type of hydraulic fluid do you use in your equipment? In today's Iron Talk, we'll discuss how upwards of 50% of the hydraulic oil being used in tractors today may be leading to poor performance and more breakdowns. I hope I caught your attention because there's a big difference in hydraulic oils that you can buy for your tractors. Also, your attention to cleanliness can have an impact as well. Let's start at the cap and work our way through your system. Removing the dirt and contamination from the cap and cleaning the filter inside will keep your hydraulic oil cleaner. If the seal on the cap is not perfect, replace that seal. It's a very cheap fix and super important. Then let's talk about that cheap yellow bucket of hydraulic oil sitting in your shop. Does it contain the right additives for your tractor specs? The reason why is that the gears, wet brakes, and transmissions you must protect are not like those on your car. For example, the transmission fluid for your car provides insufficient gear wear protection for your tractor. Cheap tractor hydraulic fluid may not be made of good stock and certainly doesn't contain the right additives as you'll often hear brake chatter with squealing and squawking. I know it may cost $30 more for a bucket of good quality hydraulic fluid that meets or exceeds multiple OEM standards and meets the specs of your tractor's fluid requirements, but it's a very small insurance policy to pay. Getting the right fluid helps extend the life of your tractor and results in far fewer breakdowns and overall better performance. Avoid sticking valves and clutch plates. Get the right hydraulic fluid for your high-performance tractors and equipment. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Well, that's our time for today, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD radio show on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central each weekday. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Did you realize that a healthy soil only contains about 50% dirt? In order for the soil microbes and plants to work together properly, soil should contain 25% air and 25% water. Today's farming practices are designed around maintaining that healthy balance. 
To learn more, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.